Today's video is for all you lovers out there. All you hopeless romantics who believe in true love. Today I want to do a deep, penetrating dive into the love affair between KISS founding members Gene Simmons and Peter Chris. And as much as Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley have attempted to rewrite history over the years, they can't change the fact that in the beginning, there was a bromance. You've heard of Bogey and Bacall, Tracy and Hepper, the Captain and Tennille? Well, today I want to tell you about the Cat Man and the Demon, the love story you haven't heard. So stick around. Cat Stanley Space Demons coming on ya. So if you're a serious fan, you're probably familiar with the story of how Peter Chris joined the band KISS. Now Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley were looking to start an epic thunderous theatrical rock group and were searching for a drummer. They ran across an ad in the classified section of Rolling Stone magazine experienced rock and roll drummer looking for original group doing soft and hard music. It was Gene who made the call in response to the ad. Now Gene Simmons and Peter Chris couldn't have been more different. George Peter John Criscola was a streetwise Irish Italian kid from Brooklyn who grew up running with gangs and playing drums at a club run by wise guys. Gene Klein, on the other hand, was an Israeli emigre who once studied to be a rabbi. But you know, as it's been said many times, probably most notably by Paula Abdul, opposites do attract. And when Peter first spoke to Gene on the phone, he remarked that he was very intellectual sounding and enunciated every word like a school teacher talking to a student. But the truth is that, in fact, Gene Simmons had actually been a school teacher. So that probably makes sense. But Gene proceeded to ask Peter a bunch of questions, things about his look, his weight, his image, and things like whether or not he'd be willing to wear makeup or a dress on stage. And, you know, this actually sounds more like somebody trying to arrange some kinky fetish sex hookup than trying to find a drummer for their band. But anyways, Peter passed the oral examination and they agreed to meet up at the famed Electric Lady Studios in Greenwich Village, New York City, the studios that had been commissioned for none other than Jimi Hendrix. So Peter got himself all decked out in his flashiest Hendrixian rock and roll regalia including a black and gold velvet jacket, gold satin pants, and an emerald green velvet shirt. He was definitely dressing to impress this weird guy. He spoke to him on the phone about image and look, the importance of looking cool and looking like a rock star. But you know, he was totally flummoxed when he arrived at the studio and came upon two rather ordinary looking long hairs dressed in paisley hippie shirts who were Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley. Here Gene had given him this lecture about how important it was to look like a rock star, to dress cool, to have a cool image. And Paul Stanley and Gene end up turning up to this meeting looking like a couple of hippie panhandlers, as Peter would later describe them. But you know, Gene Simmons' reaction to Peter was markedly different. When Peter introduced himself, Gene immediately said, you're hired. And when Peter said, but you haven't heard me play yet, Gene's response was, it doesn't matter. You look the part. You are a star. And a bromance was born. Now Gene and Paul have both recounted that it was at this meeting where Peter first told them that he was endowed with a nine inch appendage. He had a rather large male sex organ. So perhaps that maybe sealed the deal. Maybe they were intrigued that here this guy looked so cool and he was so well endowed. And they were like, hey, this guy's got to be in our band. He's going to look good in tight pants. And the women are going to go crazy. And then they agreed to arrange to see him play at the King's Lounge in Brooklyn, the club he was playing at that was run by the Mafia. 
So Gene traveled with Paul to this mob run joint where Peter was playing drums, singing covers, doing a lot of soul covers. It was a trio, two dudes that looked like a couple of wise guys, and then Peter in the middle playing drums, looking like Jimi Hendrix. And they were totally impressed with his Wilson Pickett style vocals, uh, his soulful voice and his great look and the way he just beat the hell out of the drums they loved it and you know his silver scarf and shag haircut may have looked out of place in this old school italian mob joint where everybody was dressed like a made man but it was perfect for the band gene and paul were looking to put together and they wanted this guy in their band so they arranged for a jam session they were going to get together and play at a loft that Gene and Paul had been practicing at in New York City. And again, most KISS fans probably already know this story, that the first night they played together, it didn't exactly go very well. Peter found that their styles clashed. Here Gene and Paul were into big groups like Led Zeppelin, heavy rock bands, epic thunderous groups. And Peter was bringing more of a Stonesian, Charlie Watts rock and roll vibe to the table. And apparently that first night, Peter didn't have his own drums and had to make do on a kit set up at the loft. And he just couldn't cop a feel. But that would come later. <laughs> and Peter said they hit him with a very technical song that first night. And he even thought they might have been breaking their balls by hitting him with such a hard number uh, right out the gate. And he just couldn't get their vibe down. And he remembers remarking to Gene and Paul the fact that, quote unquote, they just weren't cutting it. And this is where Gene Simmons delivers a classic line. This could have come right out of a rom-com or a classic chick flick. Gene says in response to Peter saying that they're not cutting it, he says, I don't want to lose you. All I want you to do is cut it. Now, is that a classic rom-com line or what? I mean, that's right up there with You Had Me At Hello from Jerry Maguire or Here's Looking At You, Kid, or maybe more appropriately, I Wish I Knew How To Quit You. You know, I could hear Matthew McConaughey saying that to Kate Hudson in some chick flick or Cruz Castillo saying that to Eden Capwell on Santa Barbara. But they agreed to meet up the following night same time, same KISS place, Peter brought his own drum kit this time and suggested that the band play something a little bit more rock and roll. He asked them if they had any songs that sounded like Chuck Berry. So they played him a song called Strutter. Most KISS fans know that song would end up on their first album. And Peter kicked it off with that opening drum roll in and the band fell right into it. They all got each other off and he was hired. Now over the years, Gene Simmons has told his own version of Kistory. Uh, he's tried to change the Kiss story. He said things like that being in that band was never about being friends or hanging out together. But I really think that at one point, Gene and Peter were bros, man. Because for example, in the early days of Kiss, before the band got signed, um, the drummer for the New York Dolls had died of a drug overdose. And Peter had really wanted the gig in that band, but he lost out to his friend named Jerry Nolan. And Peter was devastated. He became very depressed and disillusioned with the music business. Um, and right around this time, Kiss had had a gig scheduled at the Diplomat Hotel in New York City. It was a very important show, a show that they felt would give them the exposure they need to land a record deal but Peter was very depressed and it didn't look like he was going to be able to play the show he just really didn't want to play the show he was very disillusioned with the business so Gene came up with an idea to cheer up his bro Peter he wanted to do something to make Peter feel like a star so he ordered up a Mercedes-Benz stretch limousine to pick the band up and take them to the show and when Peter saw the limo pull up and realized it was for him, he was ready to go out that night and kick some ass. And there's another story from the early days Peter wrote about in his memoir, Make Up the Breakup. He used to talk about how when they'd be getting ready for a show, putting their makeup on, 
Peter, along with Ace Fraley, they would drop their drawers, they'd get a couple of raging hard-ons, uh, they'd walk over to Gene Simmons while he's putting on his makeup. Each would put their dick on each one of Gene's shoulders, and as much as Gene Simmons would scream and yell and protest, Peter admitted that deep down, Gene really dug the joke and thought it was hilarious. Now, this just sounds like something a bunch of bros would do. You know, you're out on the road for months and months at a time, away from home, living out of hotels, uh, probably going a little crazy. And you know, you do things like this to lighten up the mood. You know, you get a hard on, you put it on another guy's shoulder. No big deal. Gene was into it. Peter was into it. Just a couple of, just normal bro stuff, right? <laughs> and then there's another story. Peter talks about how later on, when Peter was trying to separate from his first wife, that Gene would let him use his apartment to have sex with broads. It's like, hey bro, I'm trying to get separated from this broad, and I need a place where I can go and get with this playmate. And Gene's like, hey Peter, go nuts, man. Of course you can use my apartment and get you some. I mean, that's what bros do for each other. And you know, Peter tells a story about how when he was over there with this playmate, uh, they were watching TV together in Gene's apartment, and a movie came on uh, with the actor Warren Beatty. Now, I guess Warren Beatty had a reputation around Hollywood for having what Peter described as a quote-unquote cannon in his pants and I guess it turns out uh, the woman Peter was with made a remark about how she knew Warren Beatty or intimated they might have had a relationship or a liaison together and I suppose you know even when you got nine inches you can be a bit insecure so Peter went ballistic he went full-on Elvis he pulled out his gun shot the TV screen blew out te jeans big screen TV and Gene tells a story about how when he came home I don't know if he was living with Cher at the time or where he was at but when he came back he noticed something different the TV looked a little bit bigger and he saw that there was a hole in the wall that had been plastered over and the TV screen was bigger and here Peter he probably felt bad you know after he blew out the TV screen he's like oh man Gene's gonna be pissed at me, at me. So he went out, got Gene a new TV. Not just, he didn't just replace the TV. He got himself a, he got him a bigger TV because he felt bad. And that's what bros do. Stuff like that, man. I think they were bros. I don't buy the fact that Gene tries to put it out there that, hey, this band was never about friends. It was never about hanging out. I think there was a honeymoon period when these guys were together in the early days. They were a gang of four united in their mission to make it in rock and roll, rock and roll, and they took this rocket ride together. And I think there was a bromance happening in the early days. But you know, of course, nothing ever lasts forever. I mean, Ben and J-Lo recently broke up. Uh, Danny DeVito and Rhea Perlman split up. So you know, nothing lasts forever. Even the great romances and bromances don't always last forever. But that's my video today about the bromance Gene Simmons doesn't want you to know about. He wants you to forget about. Peter, Chris, and Gene Simmons, they were bros, man. And uh, it's a great story, and I hope you dug the video. And we'll see you next time. Who's here? <laughs>